Hey everybody, it's Nathaniel Avila reporting from Dallas County and I'm here with Timberl Hildebrand reporting from Arlington, Texas. Um, and today we're going to be talking about Cinderella in the 1950s version. Yes, sir. Yep. Okay, so like what are your first like impressions of Cinderella? Um, I think I think it's a pretty interesting movie. I haven't uh I haven't gotten to watch it recently, but um, uh, I the last time I did watch it, I was kind of impressed, especially like with the level of animation that um, is reflected in this film. Um, I mean, plot wise, it's pretty cookie cutter, you know, with the princess and all that. But uh, but yeah, I think the animation is probably a really notable aspect. I mean, uh, Walt Disney went on record saying that his favorite piece of animation that they ever made in Disney Studios was Cinderella's dress transforming uh, into, like, the ball gown and stuff. Oh, yeah, that was considered to be, like, one of the hardest things that was ever done in animation at that time. Yeah, for sure. All right, so let's go into some backstory of this of this piece, and it's a bit of an extensive one. Uh, it started all the way back in 1922 when... Uh, Disney, the guy, produced a laughogram cartoon based on the Cinderella fairy tale. Uh, and he had been interested in producing, like, a second version, like, in December of 1933 as a sim silly symphony short. Uh, Bert Gillett was attached to as the director, while uh, Frank Churchill was assigned as the composer. And a story outline uh, included white mice and birds as Cinderella's playmates. Uh, to extend the story, storyboard artists like suggested visual gags, some of which ended up in the final film. Uh, however, the story proved to be too complicated to be condensed into a short, and so it was suggested as a possible animated feature film as early as 1935, starring with a 14-page outline written by Al Perkins. Two years later, a second treatment was written by Donna Coffey and Bian uh, Bianca um, Mihole, uh, in which Cinderella's stepmother was named F Florimel de la Pochelle, and her stepsisters as Wanda and Javet. <laughs> her pet mouse was named Dusty and a pet turtle named Clarissa. Uh, the stepsister's cat was named Bon Bob, and the prince's aide was named Spunk. And the sister's dancing instructor named Monsieur Carnival. Now, this version struck closely to the original fairy tale until Cinderella arrives home late from the second ball. Her stepfamily then imprisons Cinderella in a dungeon cellar. Uh, when Spink and his troops arrived uh, at a La Parchelle resistance, Dusty, <laughs> Dusty takes the slipper and leads them free to free Cinderella. Um, now, by 1943, Disney had assigned Duck Humor and Joe Grant to begin work on Cinderella as a story, uh, as story supervisors had given preliminary budget of a million dollars. However, by 1945, the preliminary story work was halted uh, during the writing stages of Song of the South, which is a movie that I never heard of and def Disney hasn't heard of. Uh, Dalton S. Raymond and Maurice Ramph constantly fought each other and Ramph was reassigned to work on Cinderella. In his version, Cinderella was written to be less passive character than Snow White and more rebellious against her stepfamily. Ramph explained that uh, his thinking was that you can't have somebody who comes in and changes everything for you. You can't be delivered it on a platter. You gotta earn it. So in his version, the fairy godmother said, it's okay till midnight, but then up to the... But from then on, it's up to you. I made her earn it. This is him talking. And what he said, what she had to do to achieve what it was was to rebel against her stepmother and stepsisters, and to stop being a slave in her own home. So I had that scene uh, where they were ordering her around. She throws the stuff back at them. She revolts, so they lock her in the attic. Uh, and he said that he didn't think that anyone took his idea very seriously. But in spring 1946. Disney held three story meetings that subsequently received a treatment from Ted Sears, Homer Brightman, and Harry Reeves, uh, dated March 24th, 1947. In the treatment, the prince was introduced earlier in the story, reminiscent of Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, and there was a hint of a cat-mouse conflict. 
On May 1947, the first rough phase of storyboarding was in the process, and an inventory report of that same month suggested a different approach with the story. Largely, though, the animals in the barnyard and their observations of Cinderella's day-to-day -day activities. Following the theoretical release of Fun and Fancy Free, Walt well, Disney Productions' bank debt declined from $2.4 million to only $3 million. <clears throat> Around this time, Disney acknowledged the need for sound economic policies, but emphasized to the loners that s slashing production would be suicidal. In order to restore a studio to the full financial health, he expressed his desire to return to producing full-length animated films by then three animated projects, which included Cinderella, Alice in Wonderland, and Peter Pan, which were in development. Disney felt that the characters in Alice in Wonderland and Peter Pan were too cold, while Cinderella contained elements similar to, like, similar to Snow White and greenlit the project. Selecting his top-tier animation talent, like Ben Sh uh, Sharpstein, was assigned a supervising producer, while Hamilton, Lusk, Wilford Jackson, and Clyde Garolimi became sequence directors. Nevertheless, production on Alice uh, in Wonderland resumed so that both animation crews could effectively compete against each other to see which film would finish first. Now, by early 1948, Cinderella had progressed further, into Al further than Alice in Wonderland and was fact-tracked to become the first full-length animated film since a Bambi. During a story meeting on January 15th, Jan uh, 1948, the cat and mouse sequences began to grow into an important element in the film, so much that Disney placed veteran story artist Bill Pete in charge of the cat and mouse segments. By the late 1940s, Disney's involvement during production had shrunken noticeably. Uh, he was occupied with trains and the filming of Treasure Island. Uh, the directors were left to exercise at their own judgment more on details. Uh, although Disney no longer held a daily story meetings, the three directors still communicated with him by mailing him memoranda, scripts, uh, photo stats of storyboards, and acetates of soundtrack recordings while he was in England for two and a half months during the summer of 1949. Now, when Disney did not respond, Rick resumed and then had to be undone when he did. Um, in one instance, when Disney returned to the studio of, on August 29th, he reviewed loose animation sequences and o ordered numerous minor changes as well as significant reworking of the film's climax. Now, production was then finished by October 13th, 1949, thus ending the tale of Cinderella. Wow. Yeah. It was pr like a lot of stuff was going on. So, like, what do you think of that, like, how it plays into the actual film? I mean, I, I guess it worked out, you know, like, the, the film did really well, and it still kind of holds up to the test of time, so I'd, I'd say it was worth it, I suppose. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like, w how would you compare the character of Cinderella to the character of Snow White? Because they were oftenly compared against each other. Yeah. Um, I mean, I'd say they're pretty different, um... I feel personally like even though that Cinderella has a fairy godmother and Snow White didn't have that, I feel like Cinderella is a more interesting character personally. She seems like she has a, I don't know, I guess because she grows up like with her, because you know obviously the stepmom didn't like Snow White and Snow White and all that, Right. but um, like we didn't really see the two of them interact. Like, with, um, with Cinderella and her stepmothers and stepsisters, we see how awful they are to her. So that makes us empathize a little bit more with her. So I think it makes her a little bit more of an interesting character because we see her hurt a little bit more uh -huh. and see how she kind of just puts up with all the crap that they put her through. Right. Um, yeah, so I, I think she, I'd say she's a more interesting character personally. Right. Yeah, um, well, yeah, like... But yeah, there are some similarities, I suppose. You know, they're both kind of like the, you know, the secret beauty who's hidden away by their awful parents, that sort of thing. Right. Like at the yeah. end, like the end of the original fairy tale where the birds would just, well, I think they blinded the stepsisters. Oh yeah, they pecked out their eyes. Yeah. That ha they, well, they changed that part because it needs to be Disney friendly. Um, but they did show that scene in the show, in the film, uh, Into the Woods. Yeah, I did see that, yeah. Yeah. Um, 
So, like, what would you say to people that Cinderella, like, perpe like perpetuates a sexist narrative that a woman needs a man in their life to feel valued? I mean, honestly, if anything, I don't think Cinderella... I mean, like, yes, it has her, like, seeking to get married and stuff like that. I think that that's kind of a silly thing to say because it's an old story, you know, and it is a fairy tale, and a trope in fairy tales is for the princess to end up with the prince. Mm -hmm. And so since it's an old fairy tale, it's going to follow that trope. And also it came out in the 50s, and the 50s, you know, their, their uh, storytelling techniques tended to fall more under that trope also. So, I mean, I wouldn't necessarily say it was sexist. I'd just say that, like, it's a fairy tale, you know? It's make-believe, much like, you know, the fairy godmother is make-believe and whatnot. So, I mean, I wouldn't say it's really sexist. I mean, it's just a, it's just a fairy tale. Mm. Now, like, do you know, do you ever thought about why the, after midnight, the glass slippers stayed, like, in reality and everything else just went poof? Oh, yeah. Um, I kind of never thought about it too hard, but yeah, that's something worth thinking about, I suppose. Yes, that might be a little bit of a plot hole. I yeah, suppose. I mean, like, how, but then again, how else are they supposed to identify Cinderella? Yeah, I will say that, like, newer versions of the story have probably made it a little bit more realistic. Because mm -hmm. it is kind of ridiculous to think that he wouldn't recognize her face or anything. <laughs> yeah, like, um... Speaking of which, what do we think about like the character, like uh, the prince's father, in this film, who basically is like the like the catalyst of the entire film? Oh, I enjoy the prince's dad. I think he's fun. I think some of these early Disney films had really interesting, like before they started the trend of like killing off all the characters, like parents. Mm -hmm. Um, I found like some of their like in Sleeping Beauty and this movie, like the king characters are quite fun. They give mm -hmm. them a lot of, like, color, and they're funny, and I think that's a lot of fun. Yeah, and in this one, I believe he has, I believe he's a duke, um, who's supposed to be, like, his comic fo comedic foil. Yeah. Um, so, like, the biggest motivation that goes on for the entire film was that the king wants grandchildren. Yeah. That's his driving force. That's why that's why the ball takes place. That's why all this stuff happens. Um, and to bring it a witch, what do we think about the stepsisters in this film? I believe their names are Anastasia and Drizella. Um, I think they're interesting enough. I mean, they're they're kind of what you would expect. I think they make them a little bit. They kind of gave them their own color by making them a little bit goofy and not so um, evil. You know. Mm-hmm. So yeah, that was cool. Yeah. I thought I think they're funny. I know in the sequel in Cinderella Two, the movie that everyone watched, uh, <laughs> they they were given a little bit more personality, especially I think it was Anastasia. I be yeah, I believe so. Yeah, who you you know ends up like falling in love with a baker and then marries him. Yeah, I heard about that. Yeah, and I, I think that's a lot nicer narrative. Because I like it when, at the end where the good bad guys become good guys. Yeah, that's fun. Mm -hmm. I like me a good redemption arc. Mm -hmm. And um, what, what else? Like, the, the character of Lady Fontaine, who's a stepmother, who basically became, like, the trope of the evil stepmother. And that stepmothers are evil. Yeah. So, what do we think? Because she's, like, the main antagonist. How is she as a villain? Oh, I think she's a great villain. You know, it's the same voice who did Maleficent, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, and that really reads. Like, they they make her a very interesting character. I think just because she's so cool and collected, that's what really um, makes her kind of terrifying and effective. Like, because she's just scary. Because she just commands a room with just a single word. Mm-hmm. And then she makes Cinderella do chores. Oh, no. Yeah. The world was gonna end. And, like... Um, so, like, let's move on to, like, the other characters, mainly the, the, the animal characters, mm -hmm. <laughs> especially, uh, the characters of Jacques and Gus. Oh, I love them. They're awesome. Who's your favorite, Jacques or Gus? I like Jacques, because he, like, he's a real take charge kind of guy. Mm -hmm. I think that's fun. I like how they speak in this weird, like, this weird English dialect. 
Yeah. So, and then also they will have they have to like uh there's this like a bunch of sequence with the character of Lucifer who is the cat. Yeah. And do do you think do you think the cat is is bad because he has the name Lucifer? Well, it definitely doesn't help. <laughs> like my name might be Lucifer, but I'm actually a good guy. <laughs> yeah, you just don't do that. <laughs> what was that? You just don't do that. Yeah, I'm gonna name my kid Badman, evil Badman. <laughs> so like, um, so yeah, like, what do you think about their sequences in this in this particular film? Oh, I think it's fun. I think it's very characteristic of you know the Disney movies. They always kind of have like a sub. They sometimes have a subplot for the animal characters and whatnot. Um, so yeah, I enjoyed it. I thought that they made the. Like, at least, they, they gave them stuff to do. So, stuff that pertained to the plot of Cinderella. So, I think that, that worked. Right. So, like, do you think that this film has, like, uh, some kind of uh, message about classism in any way? Like, the person who ended up, who was bored of nobility, but then is treated like a servant... And then all, but then becomes royalty, like this kind of shift in class with the character. Um, I mean, I don't know if I'd necessarily say it really makes a commentary about classism, because I mean, it's it doesn't really look into that. Because I mean, she still ends up being rich at the end, and the prince and the king aren't necessarily villainized in any way for being mm -hmm. kind of like the top of society. So I wouldn't say so. I'd say the story's a little bit simpler than that. Right. Um. So, like, what is your favorite song in this film? Um, I have, hmm, I honestly really like the song that the mice sing when they're trying to help Cinderella make the dress and stuff. I really like that one. You know, the one where they say Cinderella, Cinderella, something, 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 Cinderella. Yeah, I like that one. <laughs> my that favorite. Kind of weird, like, Cinderella's song isn't necessarily my favorite. Um, but, uh, but Yeah. Uh, my favorite song was uh, Sweet Nightingale, but not the one... Honestly, Cin that's probably my second favorite, okay. but the part where the stepsisters are singing. Yeah, yeah, that's what I was going to say. Not the one that Cinderella sings, the one that the stepsisters sing. No, I do think that one's a really nice song for her, too. Mm-hmm. Like, do you think she's the Nightingale? Uh, I guess. <laughs> I mean, I can't think of anyone else. But, like... What do we think about... Oh, let's talk about the Fairly Godmother. Is one of the most uh, iconic characters in this film. Oh, yeah. I like the Fairy Godmother. She's a lot of fun. I enjoyed that they gave her a little bit like of a goofiness. It makes her a little bit more fun than her just being like this all-knowing sage or something like that. Mm -hmm. Do you think that, that Cinderella was able to uh, like earn her spot into like moving like moving on or like to become like the uh what is it uh to get with the prince like or was she just given it to to her by the fairy godmother um i mean i think it's kind of like this idea that like since she's like put up with all this crap and she's still shown kindness to her um her step siblings and step family and you kind of like dealt with all that stuff that that's sort of like um, she's sort of being rewarded for the persecution that she's kind of suffered. Mm. So, like, you're saying that she suffered enough and that this is what, like, basically is her reward from, for being, you know, treated poorly yeah, but I still not being like mean. That. Yeah, like, uh, would, <laughs> I would, I don't know, like, would, in real life, would, after being ah. treated like that, for a, such a long time, would that make you, like, a te like an angry, bitter person? Well, I will say I'm probably not on the same wavelength as Cinderella. She's uh, she's got more patience than I think I would have with the step siblings and whatnot. Would you be a, like, like slap in the back of the head? Goodbye. I might not hit them, but I definitely wouldn't have as good of an attitude as she had about okay. it. I'll tell you that much. Yeah, I probably would too. Would you be all like um, yell at them and stuff? Oh, yeah, I'd probably explode, honestly. Oh, snap. <laughs> um, but, yeah, I mean, 
Yeah, that's pretty much like the entire like that's basically what Cinderella is about. And what what about like the the uh, transformation sequence where the horses transform into humans and all these different animals turn into humans? Uh, do you think that that's kind of like an odd thing to do to give a uh, like an animal human sentience? And then just rip it yeah, away. Yeah, that's a little strange. And but then, since they were already pretty anthropomorphic, it's not as weird. Okay. But now, like, they're like, oh, snap. What is death? What is life? Yeah. I don't know. I think they were already pretty aware of how death works, given that they ran away from the cat and all that. But Yeah. But now they're thinking about, like, what comes after death. Oh, I don't no. know. But, like... Yeah, things like that. But it's like, it's one of those things that you would see in a BuzzFeed article. It'd be like, the dark side of Cinderella. Boom, 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 boom. Like, yeah, that's what Buzz, BuzzFeed likes to do that. Yeah, the dark side of some random thing. And it's really just like, just like something so benign. <laughs> like, oh my gosh, uh, Pinocchio drinks uh, alcohol. Oh my gosh. And I'm like, yeah, I know, we, we it's in the movie. Um, and oh my gosh, they play pool, which is bad for some reason. Uh, <laughs> well, if you watch Music Man, it is. Oh, no, I've never seen Music Man. Oh. Is, is that yeah, a musical? Well, that's, like, well, that's part of the, the movie. Okay. Like, um, all right, like, what, what, uh, what is basically, what is your uh, favorite character in this film? Is it still uh, Jacques? Hmm. Honestly, the stepmother might be my favorite character. Oh, I just think she's really interesting. She's an inch. I think of out of all the characters, like she's the most interesting, even though she's evil. Okay, would you be like? Is she one of like the most interesting villains in the Disney pantheon? I wouldn't say she's one of the most interesting, but I would say she's definitely one of the first. Like her and Maleficent are definitely one of the more interesting Disney villains. Right. Do you think like her character basically made like a bad like a gave step step parents a bad rep um i mean that that story's really old so i mean it might have that but that's always kind of been the stereotype when it came to like literature and uh stories in general that like the step parents would be real mean and stuff like that yeah so i don't know if you can necessarily only attribute it to her right and plus like i mean there's some step parents that are all like you you could come to think of me as your dad you just, oh yeah, you just like gotta... it's definitely not always like that. Yeah, be like, come on, Bucko, you can like, I'm don't, I'm not planning on replacing your father. We're gonna make new yeah. memories, like stuff like that. Um, yeah. So, like, what are your final thoughts of this film? Uh, I think it's a good movie. I think it's a very good example of some of the stellar stuff that Disney came out with early, you know, early on. Um, especially in regard to animation. Story-wise, yes, it's pretty. It's fairly formulaic. You know, it's what you would expect from a princess movie. But, um, but definitely, like, but I still think, what I do think is interesting about even, like, the earlier um, Disney films is that they gave the story itself a little more character. Maybe not in the, they, you didn't really see it in their leads, but in their side characters. Like, that's where you saw their real creativity come out. Because, like, you know, obviously we all know about Cinderella. Oh, she's pretty. Her step-siblings are mean. Woe is her. Boo-hoo. But, like, people like the king or um, his duke or whatever, you know, they're, they're these completely new characters. Or the mice, you know, they're completely new as well. So it's kind of interesting to see how they're using their creativity to get, make the story more colorful by putting in these different characters. Yeah, like, that's one of the things that I've heard in terms of, like, story storytelling is that you make the char- the main character, the main protagonist, very bland, and then you surround that character with a bunch of more interesting characters. Well, I definitely wouldn't say that I think that should be the rule, but I do think you see that, like, in the early Disney films. Right. And even the later ones that, like, even when their leads became a little bit more interesting, these side characters were really what gave the story the Disney flavor. Like, without the side characters, this is just okay, it's Cinderella. We all know that story. But yeah, like with the side characters, it gives us more of that Disney flavor. Right. Like, can you imagine this movie without the mice? Oh, no, definitely not. (laughs) That would have been very boring. And and like this film also, I believe, like when Disney made this film, they were like $4 million in debt. 
and they were about they were about to claim bankruptcy but when this movie came out it basically rescued them from bankruptcy that's pretty awesome yeah because they before that they made pinocchio fantasia and bambi and all three of them bombed that's funny yeah i didn't know that yeah also world war ii didn't seem to help oh yeah that probably (laughs) hurt just a little bit yeah so, uh, what do you what did you think about the the song "Bippity Boppity Boo," which I believe was nominated for like a Golden Globe or an Oscar? Oh yeah, I like it. It's a cute little song. I mean, it's a nonsense song, but it's fun. <laughs> yep. Um. So, like, would you if you have a, if you had a daughter, would you show this film to her? Ah oh, yes, I've heard this kind of talk before. Oh, no. Um. Well, no, I think it is important to kind of like for, you know, parents to discuss with their young daughters, like, this is make-believe, you know, this isn't how love actually works, you have to invest in a person and stuff like that, like, it's obviously not as simple as this, but, um, I mean, I wouldn't have a problem with my daughter watching it, because it's make-believe, you know, the, the idea that you could fall in love overnight is just as much a fantasy as you know, a dress materializing out of sparkles, you know? Right. That's kind of the way I see it. If you see it on the same level, then it's fine. Right. And like... Like, it's all pretend. Right. And like, if this... If you meet a guy, like, at a party or anything, and then you leave without, like, exchanging contact info, and this guy <laughs> just goes all out trying to find you, then that's not going to... Most likely not your Prince Charming, and you should marry him. <laughs> Yeah. I don't know. That sounds kind of creepy to me. Yeah, me too, honestly. So like yeah, like stuff like stuff like that. I mean, it's like a product of its time for sure, and the world does like change and people think see things in a different light, but that doesn't mean we can't enjoy these things as long as we know like the context around them. Oh well, yeah, I mean Again, it's just a fairy tale. Mm-hmm. It's not supposed to be true to life. That's why I, I think it, you shouldn't take a movie like this too seriously. It's just, it's a movie, and it's a make-believe sort of fantasy. Exactly, yeah. Um, so yeah, that's uh, Cinderella. What, what what rating would you get, give it? Um, I'd give it like a 7 out of 10, maybe 8 out of 10. I would give it a 9 out of 10. Cool. Because I'm very generous. I'm like, I'm like the, uh, uh, you're like the Simon Cowell and I'm like the not Simon Cowell guy. <laughs> I'm the guy who's not him. <laughs> so would you recommend this film? I mean, I guess, yeah. Uh, I would too. As long as you like, do like a little, like, commentary before it. Make sure that everyone knows that this is not real. It's fantasy. And it's like an hour long. It's like an hour and 16 minutes long. So, Mm -hmm. it's not like a huge chunk of time. Alright, so that's Cinderella for you. So, that's that. (laughs) You can check it out on Disney Plus and and, and all that kind of stuff. Alright, bye. Bye.